I want to see you. Uh, I want to see you too. Please, touch me like this. Oh yes. Please. I'm coming. Panasonic, attractive technology. But I cannot feel you. But I'm not in yet. I want to feel you. Okay. Hello and welcome to another meaty chunk of retro gaming chum from Replay Retro. I'm Matt, and today we're following up on our GameCube episode with a look at a highly desirable variant of the ill-fated 6th generation console as we examine the Panasonic Q. Now we're not going to get too technical in this episode, so if you want to know more about the GameCube then check out the link in the description and take a look at the previous episode to get yourself caught up. As a video game industry veteran, Nintendo are no strangers to collaborations and deals with technology giants and they've worked with some big name companies over the years, such as Sharp, who produced the licensed twin Famicom, a cart and disc compatible hybrid of the Famicom and Famicom disc system, as well as the SF1 Super Famicom television, a deal which didn't really pay off for either company. They also briefly collaborated with Sony on a CD upgrade for the Super Nintendo, and we all know how that turned out. Once that failed, they collaborated with Philips on the same project, which again failed to materialise, although it did lead to some regrettable outings for Nintendo characters on the CDI. Unscathed by this repetitive cycle of disaster, Nintendo approached Panasonic, or rather Mashushita, to design the optical drive for their upcoming GameCube console. As part of this deal, Panasonic would receive the rights to produce and sell a DVD player with built-in GameCube functionality under their own branding. Nintendo weren't overly worried about this creating competition, as they felt that the public just wanted a games console to be a games console, and not a home media centre. A decision which would play a huge part in the failure of their new console, as rival Sony would go on to release the PlayStation 2 as one of the cheapest DVD players at the time, leading to huge commercial success for the system, with industry newcomer Microsoft also offering DVD playback with their Xbox console, which again crushed the GameCube. Released to Japan only in December of 2001, just three months after the launch of the original GameCube, the Panasonic Q was marketed as a premium version of Nintendo's toy-like system, with a high-quality metal chassis, mirror finished front, backlit LCD display, front-loading disc tray and light-up controller ports, giving the console a very different and certainly eye-catching look. Behind the cosmetic work, the system specifications were pretty much identical for the most part, with the key change being the full-size optical drive, allowing the system to play music CDs, like most other optical media-based consoles, as well as DVDs, allowing the machine to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the PS2 and Xbox. The Q also featured a series of audio upgrades, including an optical output for Dolby 5.1 surround sound, compared to the Dolby ProLogic stereo sound of the original system. While this mainly benefited movies, the system could also run virtual surround sound to enhance game audio. It could also be connected directly to a subwoofer for better bass range, while its dialogue enhancer and cinema modes made it a pretty advanced DVD player especially compared to the fairly basic functionality of Sony's console. However, these upgrades certainly didn't come cheap. The Q retailed for between 40,000 and 45,000 yen, compared to the 25,000 yen price tag of the Nintendo console. This is a difference of between 100 and 140 pounds, which seems like a lot to add multimedia functionality to a console. Nonetheless, Panasonic were confident the machine could do well, and soon revised the firmware to allow playback of other NTSC regions, clearly preparing to launch the Q outside of Japan, most likely to the US market. So what happened next? Could Panasonic book the trend of failed collaborations with ne Nintendo? Could the GameCube bring them more success than their previous foray into video games, the ill-fated 3DO? We'll find out after we take a look at the hardware itself. 
and here it is. The first thing you of course notice uh, is the, the mirror front and the large LCD panel being completely different from any other GameCube design. Many people aren't a fan of the mirror finish uh, and perhaps worry that it scratches too much, although it is apparently to some extent scratch resistant. And in fairness, the fact that mine only has a couple of little scratches on it there would seem to support that and perhaps it actually is quite a tough little front. Uh, it wasn't just unique, of course, to the Panasonic Q. There were a few DVD players of the era which also had this same kind of glass or mirror finish, especially a few by Sony that I can definitely remember seeing on shop shelves. So while it may be a little bit garish, a little bit too much by our current standards, once upon a time it would have fitted in quite well with a lot of people's home equipment. Uh, bearing in mind as well, a lot of televisions of the era were also silver, that again, the metal body of the Panasonic Q would fit in really well with those. And it is also worth knowing that it is a nice metal body instead of the plastic body of the GameCube, which again kind of backs up that whole premium vibe to the system. It is, of course, much bigger than a standard GameCube, like this one here. Standard GameCube being far, far smaller, and of course made of plastic, and having a top-loading drive instead of the more premium-finished front-loading drive. Original GameCube had a carry handle on the back though, which was seen as a pretty good feature, and Panasonic did try to carry that on by incorporating these little grab handles at the back of the LCD display, although whether or not you would really use them, especially when the system is so much more expensive, I don't really, I don't think you would. As you would expect, you have the four standard controller ports, you also have your two memory card slots, and a variety of buttons which we will go through in a little while. On the top, you have the LCD display, like you would expect from a DVD player, really. Around the side, not a lot, but you can see that underneath, the expansion ports from the GameCube are re retained. All three of them are present. And, of course, the system is compatible with pretty much every GameCube accessory that I'm aware of. Around the back, you have your main hookups, so you have two sets of audio hookups there, allowing you to connect to more than one set of speakers at a given time. You also have the socket there for your subwoofer. You also have your video connection or an S-video connection if you would like to use that. You can also, of course, use the expensive digital AV out game cables from Nintendo. They're compatible with this system. And just down at the bottom there, you can see that there is an optical out port for connecting to your home surround sound system which is pretty cool for it to feature that. Really cool thing, if you do have a, a Dolby 5.1 system, it will work with that. That's a fantastic uh, thing there. Little bit of Nintendo branding there. There's really very, very little Nintendo branding on this. I think you've basically got that logo and the GameCube logo on the front. They're pretty much the only places that this machine mentions Nintendo. You also have, of course, the usual power information, but unlike any other GameCube, you will find the DVD regioning symbol. Pretty cool to have there, obviously not something a GameCube could do typically. One other interesting difference between the Panasonic Q and a standard GameCube is, of course, as you can see here, that the Panasonic Q just takes a standard figure eight power cable. Of course, the voltage coming in has to be Japanese because again, it's a Japanese machine. So if you do own it in Europe, make sure you don't blow it up by plugging one of these straight into the mains. But yet the power supply is internal. The main power unit is internal, unlike on the GameCube where obviously there was an external power pack that plugged into the console and plugged into the wall. Meaning that if you do lose the power pack, obviously the GameCube is useless. Whereas with this, you can replace the lead fairly easily really. Around the other side you just have a little vent there for the fan to circulate air through and other than that just like the normal GameCube there really isn't a lot going on. It's only when you get up front that you really see what the system can do. Now there are actually three different ways of turning on the, uh, the Panasonic Q. You can press the power button obviously and when you do that, the system will boot up into whichever mode you last used it in. So for example here, because I last used it as a GameCube, it boots up as a GameCube. Had I last used it as a DVD player, it would boot up as a DVD player. You can see obviously when it's also in GameCube mode, the LED controller ports do light up. I don't know how well the camera is picking that up, but you can see that they do light up nice and brightly. And again, that adds to the premium finish. 
You can also, if I turn that off again, you can also turn it on by pressing the game button, which will boot it up again as a GameCube. Or if you just turn it off again, you can press the DVD CD button on top, which will boot the machine up as a DVD player. And there you go, saying no disc, because obviously there is no disc in there at the minute. The, you can, of course, you don't have to turn it off to switch between DVD and GameCube mode. So obviously we're in DVD mode now. If I press game, it will switch across to GameCube. You hear the system fan kick up because it needs more cooling to run in GameCube mode and the controller ports light up. So you can switch across. However, unlike the PS2, the Panasonic Q doesn't detect that you've put a DVD in the drive and switched to DVD mode and vice versa. It doesn't detect that you've put a GameCube game in the drive and switch to GameCube mode, which is a little bit frustrating because obviously this is supposed to be an all-in-one device and it's kind of not. It's kind of like both devices are living inside there, but you switch them on separately. Uh, unlike the PS2 where obviously whichever disc you put in, be it a DVD, be it a CD or be it a game, it would boot into the correct mode to play that, that disc. Going through the other buttons then, over here you have the dialogue enhancer, which doesn't do anything in game mode, but if you're in DVD mode, it, it kind of does work. It does boost the dialogue and make it a little bit clearer, uh, enhances it over the rest of the audio of the soundtrack. Cinema mode basically plays with the brightness settings a little bit and ups them, gives you a little bit more colour definition, although again, it's more of a personal preference than anything else. You've also got the game reset button, so that you can reset the GameCube. Again, that won't do anything in DVD player mode because it resets the GameCube and not the DVD player mode. You've then got the infrared lens so that you can use the remote control and of course your compact disc logo and your DTS Dolby Surround logo. Moving across to the other side, you also have the open and close button necessary for opening and closing the drawer which when it does open, as you can see, is a full size tray with the smaller inner ring there for the GameCube game discs, which obviously are smaller than full size DVDs. But then on the outside there, unlike the proper GameCube, there is a full size tray for you to put an actual music CD or a full size DVD in for playing. Press it again, and as you would expect, the drawer retracts. Apparently the mechanisms on these are a little bit flimsy, so there are quite a lot of them out there where the trays jam um, I've heard some people say it's because they get stuck on this face plate uh, and others just say it's because the mechanism isn't too good. Luckily mine seems to work, touch wood, so I can't really help you if you have a problem with that. You also then down here have the surround sound button, which when it's in GameCube mode basically has surround sound on or game surround on or surround sound off. Uh, however, if you switch it into DVD player mode, The surround sound has extra options, so there are two options. I'm not entirely sure what the difference between the two is. I imagine it involves tweaking little bits of the settings, and again, you pick the one you prefer as a personal preference. You also have the Bass Plus, which, as you would expect, sends the signal out to the subwoofer so that you can boost the bass of the console, and that does work in both game mode and in DVD mode, which is quite a cool thing. You can get some really good low down bass off this compared to the standard system. And as I said before, just there you have the game button for switching it over to game mode. On top, as you would expect from a DVD player, you have your standard DVD controls, so the ability to stop, pause, play. Fast forward, rewind, and of course, skip between chapters. But if you don't want to use the ones on the system, because like me, you'd rather sit down and chill out, you can of course use the Panasonic remote. Nothing special, looks like a fairly standard DVD player remote, really, with all the buttons you would expect, although obviously in Japanese, because it's a Japanese machine. Interestingly, again, no Nintendo branding on here. Just got Panasonic DVD slash game player. But it will work, obviously, with all the DVD functionality of the system. Obviously, when it comes to playing GameCube games, it doesn't do anything. The controller for the system is a standard GameCube controller in grey 
with Panasonic branding on it. Nothing special, no different to any other GameCube controller. You can use this with a GameCube, and of course you can use a GameCube controller with this. There really is no difference. Just a standard connector there. And just like GameCube controls, you do get a decent amount of flex, which as regular viewers will know, is a kind of a pet peeve for me when you don't get enough flex on a controller. And that really is all there is to see uh, about the Panasonic Q. There's no point in me really showing you any gameplay, purely because you've seen GameCube games in the GameCube video, and I'm sure we'll do a few five minute plays. Unfortunately for Panasonic, they backed the wrong horse again. The GameCube took third place in its generation, and so a more expensive version was never really going to excite the market. To make matters worse, it didn't take long for DVD player prices to start coming down after the PS2 launched, and the high price of Panasonic's premium machine meant it was actually cheaper to buy a DVD player and a GameCube separately, rather than as one unit, regardless of the high quality offered by the Q. Couple this with the clumsy way it switched between DVDs and games, rather than the fluid simplicity of Sony's offering, and you quickly see the shiny box struggling to make a positive impression as an all-in-one media device. Surprisingly, Panasonic did actually go to the trouble of producing a version of Nintendo's popular Game Boy Player for the Q, which dealt with the physical incompatibility issue of the original device, which wouldn't fit due to the size of Panasonic's machine and the fact that it had legs, unlike its Nintendo brother. But sadly, not even this effort and attention to detail could save the undoubtedly very interesting machine, and it was discontinued exactly two years after its launch in December of 2003, having sold less than 100,000 units. Today, the Panasonic Q is a pretty sought-after item due to its unique features and similar but different design compared with its more well-known sibling, and prices have been climbing steadily as a result. Complete boxed systems with the Panasonic branded pad and remote control obviously command the highest prices, with many unscrupulous sellers now selling these two key accessories separately. But if you aren't too bothered about the box, there's still some great deals to be found. That's all we've got time for in this episode, and in fact that's all we've got time for in Season 4, as we finally wrap up this unfortunately quite delayed series. Of course you can still keep in touch with the show via Facebook, or via Twitter, and make sure you're subscribed to the channel for an announcement on Season 5 and some other projects coming very soon. Once again guys, thanks for watching. Hey guys, the video you just watched was voted for by fans of the show, so if you'd like to take part in the next vote and help decide what videos I make next, then head over to our Patreon subscription page and find out how you can be involved and take part in the show. Thanks for watching guys!